The Build Show Build Boston series is sponsored by Alora Fiber Cement Siding, Mitsubishi Electric Train US, Roseburg, Shuko USA, and Warmboard. Hey, Build Show Build Boston. Steve Basic Architect. Since the last episode, we went up through the roof with framing. But now it's time to get back in the basement and start a whole new cycle moving upwards. Let's get going. Hey, before we get in the basement, I wanted to point out one thing. So our bulkheads here in New England, these are typically precast units. We have a local supplier that has various sizes. You go on, you can pick their bulkhead. But the technology for install is quite simple. You can see here, they have this heavy bead of weather stripping that they basically put on here. The precast comes with four embedded bolts and it simply gets bolted on the side of the foundation wall. So the concrete guy, he leaves and forms out this opening and then we basically just bolt this on from the inside. It's really cool technology, actually. So here's those four bolts that I talked about. You can see they have, you know, a bunch of kind of weather stripping sealant there, but basically it's just these four anchor bolts that get embedded on. The system gets applied to the outside of the foundation wall. They screw it on and then walk away. And we basically have that bulkhead hanging out on the outside of the foundation wall. There's no special forming, nothing. Stairs are all pre-made and they're set up for our Bilko uh, bulkhead and sized appropriately. So really good start to uh, talking about the basement. All right, so as you can see, we're down in the basement. You know, construction's really interesting in that we frame it, we frame it up through the roof. And then what do we do? We go all the way back down and we start back at the slab and we bring in all of the series of utilities, plumbing, electrical, all of that stuff. But as an architect, it's really important that you understand, hey, we have to give some room for this stuff, right? So I like to think of basements as two types. There's the clean basement and there's the dirty basement. The dirty basement is the section of basement where I don't care as much about what happens. Meaning if I have ductwork or if I have a plumbing pipe that has to run under the floor joist, etc., it's not really of a concern to me. And the general contractor knows exactly where the demarcation of clean versus dirty is down here. We already walked through that with them. So I'm standing in a section of what I would consider the dirty basement. So any plumbing that comes down from a shower drain up above or a toilet drain, if it runs down under these joists, it's no problem. And we're actually planned for that with our um, plumber. So we're upstairs. This is the secondary bath. I call it a Jack and Jill. Some people have different names for it, but basically it's the sink room. And then back here we have the tub and toilet, but you can see the plumber's already been here and he's done some preliminary layout. You can see he's calling for a three inch line, the center of the sink or lavatory there. And then you can see it here also that he has them marked out. And again, these are preliminary to find out and investigate to make sure that we don't have any problems. You can see he has it marked out for the center of the toilet there, but notice there's a little wire. So if I pull this up, you notice that, yeah, he has a little wire that's going through there and goes down into the basement. So let's go down into the basement. We'll look up and we'll see what that little wire is all about. We also have a bunch of other things going on in our dirty basement. You can see over here, we have our radon pipe stubbed out. We have another one on the far side. If you remember that floor plan from the earlier episodes, this house is you know, about 70 feet long this way, but it's about 90 feet long in that direction, makes the L. So having one radon pipe in, I didn't think was really enough given how far um, that part of the basement is displaced from this one. So we actually put in two systems. We also have two sump pump systems here. So you can see the drainage pipe has been run. The septic or the sump basin is in. Those are airtight sump basements. 
because we don't want any of the air underneath our slab to be communicating with the air in our basement. Somewhere right around here is where we're gonna have a wall that kind of sets that up as the dirty basement. And we'll have electrical, we'll have a bunch of switch gear for our solar panels. We're just gonna have a whole bunch of stuff filling up on that wall. As we walk down here, we're gonna be in a storage area of the basement here till about somewhere right here. And then we're gonna have another wall here. So we'll have a little fitness gym here that has a window to that opening there. So those are approved egress windows that we have happening there. In the far reach of the basement there is the fourth bedroom. And so that also has an egress. So if we're gonna take the time to put in the effort to build that well, to put in a window opening, I suggested to the homeowner that we put two of them in, put a mall section large enough that if they ever wanted to, they could take this fitness room and get yet another fifth bedroom out of the deal. So that's basically the plan layout here. And over on this side here, between kind of the community space and the bedroom fitness wing, we have a bathroom in here. And as you can see, some of the plumbing has already started to run here. Now, the exit point, which is a critical point to understand, where is the plumbing leaving the house? Now, here we don't have city sewer. We actually have a septic system. The septic system has <clears throat> been engineered and sized to work out in the front of the house slightly downhill, which is a benefit because we're able to leave the house underneath the footing with our exit pipe and go out across the driveway into the lower front yard and put our septic system in there without having to have any type of grinding pump or ejector pump system placed in the house. Everything here is running via gravity, which is a really good place to be in my opinion. Anytime we have to rely on mechanicals and electrical pumps, etc., they have a chance to fail. Gravity, if gravity fails us, we're all in trouble, right? So. Understanding that, now we build back the plumbing system from our port of, point of exit there. And as you can see, our plumber here did an exceptional job where throughout the whole living space, he was able to come up and engineer a plumbing system that works below the slab. And then we have this one riser here that is gonna come up above the slab, as you can see here, and then this will eventually connect over to the wing back here, which is where the owner's bathroom is. So we have a couple sinks, the shower and toilet. We'll all make their way to this wall. We'll have a plumbing pipe that comes down in the dirty basement, come down, drop into there. And then it goes below the slab. As you can see here, it's all set up to come down and connect basically you know, this is the interstate right here, if you will, of the basement plumbing system. So we have our riser from the owner suite that comes in and ties in here at the 45. We have a secondary pipe here that also ties in at a 45. And this is basically the tub, the toilet or water closet, and then the bathroom vanity here. So you can see here, when you're doing plumbing, <clears throat> below grade, it all has to get pressure tested. And the plumber was nice enough to leave all of his equipment here. So we have a pressure gauge and we have the valve there. So he has to pump that up to five PSI and it has to hold that five PSI for 15 minutes. Um, we have our plumbing inspection here tomorrow. Um, they'll check it all out, maybe redo the 15 minute test. And then we'll have the ability to cover this up. So. We have our systems that go down here. They go down into the highway. Now, one of the critical pieces of any master piece of plumbing or main piece of plumbing like this highway is, what if it gets clogged? How do we deal with that? We need to have what's called a clean out, right? So, welcome to my finish line clean out. What that basically is is that is a clean out that's gonna come up in the floor. It's designed to come up in the closet of this bedroom that's behind me here. And it's set to be on 
top of the, or flush with the top of the finished floor there. So that will be, you open up the closet door, there'll just be a small black cap down in the hardwood floor there that's basically covering that up. But should this drain ever get clogged, the plumber will be able to come in here, pop that cap off and drop a snake in here and have a straight shot all the way to the exit point. If we follow this pipe down, you'll see we have the bathroom here, but then it's pretty much a straight shot all the way down to our point of exit here. So you can see here, two, three things are happening. Obviously our main highway pipe is coming down and you can see it turns and it goes into our port point of exit here. That pipe will eventually lead out to our septic system. But we also have a riser on this side. Now, remember, clean basement, dirty basement. Over on this side of the house, this column line here, and it turns the corner 90 degrees there and goes into the foundation wall. Well, this is clean basement over here. This is dirty basement over here. So again, the riser pipe is designed to come up in the dirty basement. So all of our plumbing over here, which consists of laundry room, powder room, plant room, kitchen, all of that plumbing will make its way over to this wall, come down alongside the wall, drop in here, and make our point of exit right here. So that handles pretty much all of the underground plumbing. Now, one of the benefits of having underground plumbing as opposed to the plumbing rising, running overhead and overhead in one of the rooms that you want to be cognizant of as an architect or homeowner, architectural designer, builder. I mean, pretty much anybody that's building the house, right? If you're building a custom house and you're sitting in here watching TV in the media room and someone flushes the toilet upstairs, you don't want to hear the gurgling of water coming through the pipe overhead, making its way over here to the septic tank. So working with our plumber and coming up with a system that's pretty much about 80% below grade, it takes care of the acoustics of that plumbing, right? The media room is here. The above grade plumbing is down around the corner a significant bunch, as well as over here and down in the dirty basement there. So when that toilet flushes in the powder room, we're not hearing that gurgling sound in the media room. Now, these might be small pet peeves, but these are things that when the homeowner's sitting in their nice custom room, media room in their custom house, and they hear the gurgling of the toilet being flushed every time, it's like, how did we not think about that? Why did we not get rid of that? So, you know, working with a, an architect with some experience, these are kind of the questions that come to the top that, yeah, we have to get the plumbing in, but let's be concerned about these other aspects of it. So anyways, that's our plumbing. You can see here, we also have our drain line that runs over the top. This is all gonna get backfilled. And just like over on the other side, you can see we have our secondary sump pump here. Now, the other thing about sump, two sump pumps is that sump pump is gonna be one inch lower than this one. So we'll take this pump, we'll actually put it on a brick or a rock. I have exactly the same system at my house and it'll be raised up one inch. Now, the reason for that is the town wants to see most of the water get reclaimed on site. Meaning that the other sump pump in the back of the house over there, it's gonna go out to the back side of the house it's gonna get dropped into a field where it can then percolate back into the ground within the site and basically be reclaimed on site. Now, should that sump pump fail, this one kicks on. This one kicks on, it goes up and it's gonna go out to the front yard here and it'll drain to daylight. But the idea for the homeowner, the notion for the homeowner is if they ever hear this sump pump come on, what it means is that the primary sump pump on the other side of the house has failed. And it has forced this one to come on because if that one fails, the water's gonna rise that additional inch and trip the float on this front sump pump and activate it. So they know immediately that they have a failure in the first pump. But the other thing is if you're on vacation and you're just relied on one pump, 
then if that pump fails, your basement floods, right? Not that I'm concerned so much here, but I'm thinking in general in basements. In my house, it certainly would. If, if my, one of my pumps or both my pumps shut off, I would get six inches of water in my basement in about 24 hours. So, you know, it's a good measure. It's an extra basin, an extra pump. I get it, but it's a security measure that ensures that everything stays dry. Now, you remember when we were talking about um, the foundation, and if you haven't seen it, I recommend you go back. We had a really good foundation episode, the framing episodes. Go check them out. But in that foundation episode, we worked long and hard to make sure that we're doing really diligent water management underneath the slab here with the two sump pumps and how water gets to them. So go check that out. The last order of business is, here's our second radon pipe. You can see here, it stems up. Now this one here actually makes the shape of a T. You can see I, we took the time to dig it out. So the riser's there, but it extends pretty much all the way from this side here, which is about a little over eight feet to all the way over here. So we get a good 16 foot run here laterally that's picking up any, any gas that's gonna be below our insulation and below our stego wrap. So our stego wrap is gonna act like the hot air balloon, if you will, and any gas that tries to migrate northward through the floor assembly, the stego is gonna put, act as the barrier, stop it. And then these pipes are gonna collect it and we're gonna have an inline fan that connects that. And then this one here, not only does it T laterally that way, but it comes off the face of the pipe. And for here, it comes off 16 feet. And you can see we dug this out right to the end. So we have that here. So that's our secondary radon pipe. The other one is also very similar. You can see all of our columns, footings. It looks like uh, we're ready for concrete. So in the upcoming days, what's gonna happen here is everything's gonna get leveled out. Our plumbing will get inspected. It'll get okayed. We have our risers out. And then we're gonna begin insulating on top of the stone. And then we're gonna put our stego uh, vapor barrier, radon barrier on top of that. And then we're gonna pour our concrete slab down here and then we'll be good to go with utilities and start moving up through the house with those. So there you have it. This is everything that's happening under the insulation. All right, exciting day today. We're up here, we're putting in some of our sub slab insulation. We're getting that all prepped so we could get that slab down there and start running utilities out here. And we're about to catch up with Jesus. Jesus is the owner of Advanced Green Insulation. How you doing, buddy? Good, you, sir. All right. And you're responsible for the whole insulation package here. Now, I know today we're just starting with some sub slab stuff. We're not doing anything up above grade um, with the walls or the roof. But uh, before we go inside and see what we're doing, why don't we take a minute or two and just talk about your company. So give us uh, what we need to know. 100% sure. Yes, we are a company on a market over a decade. We have an, uh, over 140 employees on, a, on the road. And uh, we serve from all the way down to Martelzino to up to Vermont. And uh, it was a pleasant to me just doing this job with you guys. It's for me, it's like phenomenal, really, really opportune, great time to do it. Well, we're excited to have you. And did I hear you right? 140 employees, you have something like 40 or 50 trucks? Yes, we have a 42 trucks on the road. 42 trucks on the road, and you do all types of insulation, all right? Type it's of not insulation. just spray foam, it's not just rigid board. You'll source whatever insulation, me as an architect, specifies. LDS Construction, obviously, they're a general contractor here. So whatever we need, it's one-stop shopping with you. 100% sure, we, we cover all the, all the type of spray foam, blowing cellar laws in fiberglass. Uh, we do thermal berry painting. We are one-stop shop. We always we work hard to make sure we meet the satisfy of the building spectrum. All right. Well, I know we're guys are downstairs. They're anxious to get started. So let's make our way. We'll go check that out and uh, let's see what we're doing now. Yeah, that's it. All right, buddy. All right, Bill. Hey, Kev. Steve, how are you? So, so it looks like all the plumbing and stuff has been covered up. 
and uh, we're all leveled out, ready to get some insulation down here. I'm assuming that means everything went well with the building inspector, plumbing inspector. Yeah, underground's all inspected, backfilled to grade. We left, uh, we left it down two inches to accommodate the insulation, four inches of insulation um, on the stone coming up the wall. So for everybody to understand, we have eight inches of stone here. We have our interior drain that we talked about when we were doing the uh, foundation episode. Yes. <laughs> We have our two inches there. We're gonna spray four inches of closed cell foam on top of here, and then we're gonna turn it up the corner, up the corner and turn run it up the wall as a two inch insulation as part of our wall assembly. There. Yes. All right, so it seems like we're all set. I just caught up with Jesus outside. I'm gonna go over there and we're gonna have a little bit of talking about uh, exactly that insulation. I can see the guys are about to get ready. So uh, I'll catch up with you a Sounds little later, good. buddy. Thanks. Hey, Jesus, it looks like we're well underway here. Yeah, we got here we are. Under slab insulation. I know we're working towards getting that slab in here, but we're using a closed cell spray foam. Now, I know a lot of people watching this video are going to make some kind of comment about like the sustainability or the green aspect of this. But when we talked about what products we were going to use, we talked about, you know, the sustainability of this, the option of this versus say a rigid foam, which, I mean, no matter what we put down here, it's going to offer some type of environmental challenge, sure. right? The minute we choose to build something, we inherit some type of environmental challenge to what we do. But, you know, you spoke very highly of this product. It's the greenest, if we can use that term, um, closed cell spray foam on the market currently. Yes, it is. Right? This is our closed cell 2000 SL, uh, XL product. Uh, this product, it's a HFO, was a new product in the market, HFO, Green Guard, certificated Green Guard. And that's Guard. a waterborne blowing agent for those that don't know, right? Yes. The HFO. Yes. And this product, um, it's, we highly recommend this type of application, especially when we use this product. And the way we're going to use here, we're going to do a continual vapor barrier with, uh, we're going to build this, uh, the vapor barrier along the walls coming up a little bit. Right it's give, gonna give us the best, best vapor barrier ever. So let's start with the R value of this per inch. Most yes. insulations are measured in R value per inch. And for this, we're talking? Yes, uh, this product, this particular product is have a high R value in the market. It's a 7.4 per inch. 7.4 per, per inch. inch. In the field of the floor here, we're putting four inches. Four you inch. can see that it's getting built up here. So that puts us at over, roughly about R30. Yeah, a little bit over an R30, uh, roughly R30 per inch. An R30 per inch. And I noticed here we also have the footing where we're actually capturing a couple inches. So we're still getting an R15 or exactly. so above the footing there. So the beauty of this, and you had mentioned it in the vapor control layer, but by come, having the ability to come over the top of our footings means that one of my favorite words in building science is establish continuity. Yes. 100%. And because we've established continuity and it's imper virtually impermeable, right? It's a class one vapor barrier. Class one vapor barrier. So no moisture has the ability to migrate through it. The continuity also makes it a continuous thermal barrier. So as far as our control layers, you know, we check off too. And the fact that it's somewhat, I, I won't say perfect air barrier, but it's arguable that it makes a really good air barrier. 100% sure. And not that I believe that the, the ground is really bleeding a bunch of air anyways, but so we've basically checked off three boxes of our control layers. The fourth one being water management, but that's being taken care of with our stones, well. our perimeter drain. And I noticed that you sprayed around the, the sump basin there. We have our radon pipe, et cetera. So, I also see that we're able to come up along the side of the walls. And I just talked with Kevin and we talked about getting a couple inches there. This is going to turn up the wall and we're going to spray about two feet up the wall, exactly. right? Exactly. That's what we're going to do. We're going to put it, we're going to bring in the, the closed cell to up in the foundation wall. And then later, when you're going to finish the basement, we're going to merge them together. It's going to create a continual vapor barrier all the way up to so the So as house. we frame our wall, then we'll come down the wall with the two inches and just basically climb over the top make that connection, and then we maintain that continuity up and into the joist bay with this product. Yes. And then we'll have the ability to put an unfaced bat or something. Whatever we want to do. Whatever we want to do is our optional insulation 
inside that frame. So, um, yeah, it looks like your guys are doing a really good job. I mean, this was just sprayed, what, maybe an hour ago, yeah, and still, you can walk you across it. Walk. So, um, for anybody that's worried about, hey, is this going to hold the slab or whatever, it's, uh -huh. it's holding my 150-pound <laughs> frame. So, um, you know. It, it's excellent uh, plotter. So, as you said, we literally sprayed the material a couple of hours, like about an hour ago, and we can literally walk in and it's a fast up application, and, um, and that's how we do it. That's all right. happened. Well, I'll leave it to you. Your guys will get that all because right after this, we're going to throw down some 15 mil Stego um, vapor barrier, and then it's the concrete slab. And I mean, take a look at this, everybody, because you're never going to see this foam for that's about it. 100 years. Over. We know. I hope we're not going to. I hope we never I see hope, it again, yeah. right? All right. But, but that's our hope. Thanks for all your Thanks help, so buddy. Appreciate it. Thank Alrighty. You. All right. So we got our aggressive homeowner here, Scott. Hey, Scott. But hey, Steve. Before we get to Scott, we have a really good cross section of what's happening here. So. Let's just take a, a second here to review. We have our 10 inches of stone. That's part of our water management system. Then we have our four inches of closed cell. We just reviewed that with Jesus. And that's our thermal barrier, our air barrier, as well as our vapor barrier. But because we don't necessarily trust the closed cell foam to be perfect in its continuity, we've addressed that chance by using Stego Industries. It's a 15 mil poly. It's their vapor barrier for residential construction. And that's the green stuff you see going on here. And we got Scott, the homeowner, like I said, aggressive homeowner that wants to be, you know, do his part in the construction. So let's go over here. We'll catch up with Scott and we'll talk a little bit more about what we're doing out here. So how you doing, buddy? Hey, Steve. So how are you? I can see you're hard at it. Nice to see you. How did, I, how did I do? Um, you did really good. So one Thank of you. the things about continuity is, is that obviously when we're putting down a sheet good like Stego Industries, um, 15 mil vapor barrier, well, we have some areas where we have plumbing coming through the sink drain, we have our columns. And so we have to address those punctures through and maintain that continuity. And as you can see here, um, Scott's, uh, he's doing it like a pro. He's, uh, he's a homeowner that wants to be part of this, and, uh, and he is, in fact, and you can see he's doing it real well. Um, Scott, you want to talk a little bit about uh, what you found about doing this? Was it, I'm assuming it was pretty easy to install? It, surprisingly easy. Uh, I did it yesterday afternoon for this section, and I used basically the double edge tape that the Stego Home pro provides uh, for all the edges. And while and you're talking, I'm just going to grab a piece of this here. It's a 15 mil, mil poly, and it was in the cold. It's uh, it's still workable, pretty easily to be be done. And that's that's a piece of the uh, double edge tape. Yeah, on the back. so it has. They have a, you know, Stego Industries does a really good job, like most good manufacturers, in supplying everything beyond just their product. So right. not only do they supply the vapor barrier itself, they supply a double sided tape, so you can tape the seams or around the edge. And we're going to talk about that but they also supply a seam tape. And so, yeah. Which is really great because it's also the kind of thing you don't need, you don't need a knife to cut. I've been using a knife because I'm trying to make it neat for you, Steve. Nice and clean. Uh, thank and you. Because I'm a hard inspector. He I is, it. very hard inspector. Uh, I have to live up to the expectations. Uh, it's a really straightforward process to do. I rolled it out, there's a, we were using two different types. We're using 100 feet by six feet and, a, and pieces that are 12 feet wide by 50 feet. Right. And I just found by cutting them, even doing it alone at reasonable lengths, as you can see, I only had you know one break there. It's a very straightforward process to do. And given the radon problem that we had down here in the, in the old house, not in this one, right. uh, the radon problem, uh, I was really concerned about making sure that we uh, did everything possible. What's interesting also, I don't know if I mentioned to you, but I just put a radon monitor down here uh, in the last few days. Uh, and there's a four before it's before anything has been um, 
uh, just with stone fully down sealed up, before right. anything's been sealed. So we're really addressing that and I'll be looking to, we're gonna leave that down here and watch it as we go along. Right, and for those of you that might not have seen it, we did a bonus episode where we talked about our radon mitigation process there and we did the mock-up and had the Stagos Industries uh, vapor barrier, but here you can see it in its entirety. And you know, one of the ways I like to explain it is, think of it as a giant hot air balloon that we're putting over the ground. So nothing in the ground can now migrate up. And around the seams there, we're taping it off. Now, one of the details that some people might put in question is, around the perimeter here, a lot of people like to take the stego and turn it up the wall and run it, say, 18 inches or so up the wall. As you can see here, we ran it to the wall. We have our double-sided tape there that is uh, holding it down against the insulation. Now, one of the things in our review of the details with the general contractor was, if we run the stego up, one of the problems is, is snapping a line on the stego vapor barrier so that his concrete guy has something to screed to. It becomes a really big challenge as well as the minute you turn the corner and you place concrete in that corner, it kind of tugs on that concrete if it's not perfectly placed. So we, we came up with the detail where we were gonna run it up to the wall. We did contact the people at Stego Industries and ran the detail by them and they were totally fine with what we're doing here. So we have the belt and suspenders of the closed cell spray foam, our Stego Industries vapor retarder, radon mitigation system. Scott's doing a great job sealing it around and you, you're standing on some of your own artwork there. This is actually, if you remember, this is the clean out to the plumbing system where we have our main drain that runs across. But you can see Scott did a beautiful job there, textbook um, look at sealing that up. So it appears we're ready for concrete. Um, I know You've been thoroughly impressed with our team down here. Everybody from LDS through Jesus and his insulation team. Um, the guy that put the stego down did an okay job. But uh, <laughs> well, he's just learning. He's just learning. But uh, he's an apprentice. Uh, no, and the plumbers were absolutely fantastic. RGC Plumbing was uh, Bob from RGC was and his team were absolutely amazing to work with. Uh, they, 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 they suffered through many of my questions, and uh, it was just a good process. And Jesus' group has been fantastic. Uh, we've been very, very lucky with LDS leading that effort, and you're overseeing everything. It's been a great, great process so far. Yeah, and it's, uh, I mean, and, it's and Matt looking And Matt King, King's team for the, uh, for the framing for the has framing been fantastic. And it's all, it's starting to come along. It's, yeah. it's really interesting that, you know, we build the house up, we get through roof framing, and then we come right back down to the basement I know. and start all over again with new stuff. But uh, A couple of things I want to mention here. <clears throat> One of the things I found was really important is I rolled every, every piece of tape. I rolled the double edge tape. Um, and, and the other thing is I never would have felt comfortable with, this, with, with the not going up the wall with, without the uh, spray foam. Right. Because of, the, because of the radon issue. But I think we're, we're, we're golden here the way it is. Yeah. And this detail <clears throat> should, you know, prove to be very good in that. You know, this is a detail that I did on another project with LDS. They'll snap a line on the closed cell. It'll hold that line. Concrete guys will be in here. And uh, I don't know, in a few days, we're going to have a totally different look down here again. That'll be nice. So I was down here yesterday in, the, uh, in what was a fairly cold day with, we, had st we actually used Stego to cover up the, the, some of the openings on the outside, which is a heavy enough material that it acted as a great curtain for that. And with the first application of, of, the, um, of the spray foam on this section and so forth, it was not, it was, it was not cold down here. It was, right. uh, it was very, very comfortable working. Well, every step that we take from here on out certainly is gonna prove to uh, be advantageous to the build. So uh, let's break here. Next step, we're getting some concrete in here. Sounds good. And many thanks to Steve as always, because he's a wonder. Well, we're, we're trying. Concrete, next up. There's probably no secret on what we're doing today, right? We got pump trucks. We got concrete trucks. We're dropping the concrete in. We're doing the slab today. Got my good buddy Jake here on the pump truck. 
And uh, just like when we did the foundation, we had the boom truck, we need to be able to get this concrete all over that basement inside. So we have the pump truck with a landline here, dropping that concrete. We're gonna go downstairs and see the action down there. But uh, a couple things before we go down there, you see the concrete getting dropped in. For those of you that wanna know exactly what's coming out of that truck, it's a 4,000 pound concrete. It's got a 3 8 inch stone gravel. And we're using a microfiber mesh that's in the concrete rather than that traditional six by six welded wire fabric. That's kind of, uh, for the most part, gone by the wayside. There are still a few guys that use it out there, but uh, we get a, a fiberglass mesh that gets mixed right in at the plant, the batch plant. So every yard of that concrete has got reinforcement built into it. So as you can see, it's getting pumped in. We're using our window well here as the access. It's actually working out quite nice because if you remember the house is shaped like an L. This is literally right in the crux of that L. So we can start down on the far side and draw near that well and then move over to that far side, draw near the well, and then that'll be the exit point. But anyways, let's head on up. We'll go downstairs and uh, we'll see where the action is. All right, so concrete slab day. Who does not like concrete slab day, right? It's almost as exciting as floor framing day, but not quite, but very close. So last time we were here, we talked about Stego Industries, vapor barriers down, our three inches of closed cell spray foam. It's installed down. Next step, concrete. Now. Concrete is not something that you just kind of throw down here and then, hey, we'll figure it out while the concrete's pouring. We need to be sure that everything is planned for when the concrete starts rolling. So they got their laser out. You can see that. Laser's tossing a line around the basement. They have the ability to measure down. That's going to provide a perfectly level space. And you can see you can measure down from the laser line and then get that exact dimension all around the slab here. So that's how they understand that a point over here and a point 70 feet down the foundation wall there is exactly level and they can screed to that line and they know that the slab is you know, level across the basement here. So as you can see, just like when we did the foundation walls, we have a pump truck outside we have our line here. We don't have the ability to boom it in here, but they put a ground line in. You can see it's all coupled here. And uh, concrete is starting to roll out the corner there. We got an army of guys. They're fixing to move that concrete around, get it nice and level. So why don't we go down there and uh, see what's happening, where the action is. All right, so you can see here, we're over here now. We got the first truck is in place. We're onto the second truck. And uh, you know, the interesting thing about placing a concrete slab is that you can see it's like a beehive here. You have a lot of guys doing the work here. And the interesting thing is every one of them has a very specific job and is related to the next guy doing the work, right? We have a guy dropping the concrete. We got guys moving it with shovels. We got guys picking it up with the screed, leveling the floor. We got it gentlemen floating the floor, but everybody has a job so that in the end, we have that beautiful slab down here, all finished up, in place, and uh, ready for the next steps down in the basement. The one thing I wanted to point out while we're here, we talked about having that red line along the uh, insulation there, but also notice on all the interior columns that they actually took the time to mark the elevation there. So that gives us some interior spots that we can understand where level is in the middle of the slab. So really cool stuff. You can sit here and watch these guys for days, but uh, you know, this is teamwork. And the, the last thing I'll say about this is, you know, there's a lot of tools. There's a lot of equipment that have made this job easier over the year. Obviously the hose, 
pumping concrete. We got a concrete truck, you know, 120 feet away, and we have the ability to pump the concrete here. But the reality is, is the end product is being finished by somebody using their hands, a guy that is 100% craft work in getting that slab just right, finished to look beautiful, and no machine can replace that. So kudos to these guys, all the teamwork going on here. Hey everybody. So, yeah, got my good friend Big Red here. We're in the studio. I got a uh, detail here of our slab assembly. I thought uh, nothing better than uh, have Big Red and uh, myself walk us through that slab assembly and uh, review what we saw out on the construction site. Hopefully you enjoyed that. Always uh, pretty cool watching uh, concrete slabs and uh, concrete, anything concrete getting cast and uh, put together. So anyways, let's check this out. We'll do a quick review of the water management. We'll get into what's happening in our slab assembly and uh, yeah, foundations. So let's take a look at it. So here you go. This give you an orientation. That is our foundation wall. And this is our footing. There, you can see there's that uh, footing drain that has access to uh, both sides that we talked about. If you uh, wanted to check that out, go uh, back and look at the um, foundation episode where we talk about that at some length. That connects. We have a stone pad here that is wrapped in filter fabric. On the outside here, we had our blue barrier, which basically is the sealant that seals that cold joint of footing to wall. And then we have our drainage, well, we have our 60 mil waterproofing system that goes on the outside of the wall. And then we have our drainage mat that goes on the outside. So the idea is if any water tried to get in here certainly the waterproofing is acting like the barrier system or the, the alamo which is not the best um, analogy i gotta come up with a better one because the alamo wasn't a very successful result but that drainage mat the idea is if any water gets into that system it's simply going to fall to gravity it's going to make its way you can see the waterproofing turns the corner it's going to make its way into the stone bed here and now I know some of you were concerned about putting in these footing laterals, but the idea is if water starts filling this up, right? Well, those laterals are going to allow the water to go in. The water is going to go in and, you know, until the water gets to a point where it can actually weep into that pipe, who cares if I have water standing out here in the first two inches? When it goes into that pipe, it's going to go to one of the two sump pumps you saw in the video. The back sump pump is going to go out and get perked into the ground. Um, the front sump pump is going to be kind of an emergency relief if that back pump ever failed. That front pump will come on, kick the water out to daylight on the front. Now, before some of you go off the rails on me in the comments, understand that the town that this house is being placed in, and a lot of towns in our area require that the water can't leave the job site. So we have to put in um, a research system that allows us to take the water that we would get here, pump it a good distance away from the house, basically into a leaching field system, and put it back into the ground. Um, most likely at or below the level of the foundation because we don't want it uh, coming back to the house and just creating this loop. We actually need it to go away. Um, so the front one goes to daylight, but we explained it to the building inspector who, who did cause, raise some concern about it. The front sump pump will be set one inch above the back sump pump. So it will never come on 
if the back until the back sump pump has failed and it'll come on and if the homeowner sees the water out in the front or hears that pump come on they know that the primary pump is failing so anyways underneath the slab on this side if you remember we have our stone bed here we had our perimeter drain that went all around the uh, whole interior and at some point it would you know tie into a sump basin and then get ejected out um, notice also that we had our good friend Jesus and his crew come out and they sprayed the insulation and this is closed cell spray foam it is uh, it meets the green guard standard and it has a GD, GWP or global warming potential of one or less so yes it is spray foam but it is uh, one of the best if not the best one um, from an environmental standpoint on the market so so we turn that up the wall and you know the detail here shows it but those guys actually sprayed it up here we'll connect it to some foam that will later be placed on a wall that will get framed in front of this um, but the most important thing is that we turn the corner and have that ready to be able to connect the wall insulation down remember one of my favorite words in all of building science is continuity right you cannot talk about building science without continuity being in almost every sentence. So our four inch slab here, and but before the slab got cast, remember, I have that dashed line, I'm just redrawing it here. We had our stego wrap, um, and you can see that it's called out right there, 15 mil stego wrap. Now, a lot of people talk about bringing it up to the edge, taping it off, all of that good stuff. Um, in a pre-casting slab meeting, talking with the uh, concrete subcontractor and the general contractors, one of the concerns are is if we bring this up and we tape it off up here, there's no real good place for them to snap a line to get that slab at a nice, perfect level. Um, not that nice, perfect level is, you know, accomplished because they're all probably out a little although these guys do an absolutely phenomenal job but uh you can imagine 3200 square foot slab um if we get it within about an eighth of an inch in elevation plus or minus i think we can call that a very very successful casting of the slab um and the other issue is is you know if you put that stego in and you tape it off you have to tape it off very very loosely at this joint um, because as the guys walk on it if they walk in that corner or if this is somewhat tight here and then you cast the concrete in there it's going to pull on that it's going to rip it down off the wall and even if you had a snap line on there it's not gonna you know be there anymore it just wreaks havoc um, so we checked with the people at stego and we used their double-sided tape and we basically took the stego to the edge of the closed cell foam and taped it off with a piece of double-edged tape. It's part of their system. It's integral to their system. They're the ones it's uh, totally proprietary. So um, it works it works extremely well. And uh, there you have it. Um, you know, we then cast our slab put in some control joints and uh, you saw it. I mean, seven hours later, we were walking across that slab. Um, they did a, a beautiful job out there. LDS is doing a great job putting this uh, place together. So anyways, that's our slab assembly detail. Big Red giving us a little bit of assistance here. Um, yeah, if you got any questions, you throw them in the comments below or uh, you know, let me know. Find me, you know, wherever. I'm out and about. So if you got any questions, message me and I'll do my best to get you an answer. So anyways, that's our slab assembly out at Build Show Build Boston. Long live our buildings. And here we are, finished, ready to rock and roll. We'll let it uh, 
do its thing over time, but the slab is in. Got my good friend Kevin here. What's up, buddy? Steve, how are you? Kevin from LDS. I'm sure you all remember him, the how are general you? contractor here. So, pretty amazing. Seven hours ago, we were standing here watching them turn on the pump truck and uh, dropping concrete. And here we are, all the way to finished. We got control joints in. Um, how many yards of concrete we do today? About 50 plus. About 50 plus. So, seven hours, 50 plus yards of concrete. Nice slab. We already got the control joints, like I said, cut in. For those of you not familiar with control joints, basically what we're doing is giving a weak spot to the slab so that when the slab comes under any stress, rather than it choosing where it's going to crack, it's going to find the weak spot and it's basically going to crack along that weak line and we would never see it, right? Unless it gets really bad and this side starts to displace from that side. But, um, but your guy does a good job. Yeah, JFF Concrete out of Walpole. They come in here with about eight guys full of, uh, full of energy at 6 a.m. this morning. Um, they did a great job. So, you know. Yeah. One of the interesting things, you know, watching them is there's kind of a, I'll, I'll say pecking order because I can't come up with a better line, but there's certain like jobs that certain guys get to oh, do, yeah. right? There's, there's the, the, the one poor soul that just, He's the one who gets yelled at, take this, do that, get me a shovel, get me this. And then there's, you know, all up to the guy that's managing the pump and then the guys that are screening it and, uh, you know, getting it level, the guys that are making sure that we're hitting our line there and troweling it off around all the columns. But man, these guys, JF, JFF Concrete, they do a beautiful job in and out of here, like I said, seven hours can't complain about that and uh yeah we got a slab so you know what that means it means we get the plumber we get the hvac guy and coming we get the electrician <laughs> and we get to start putting in utilities we got the roofer coming up roofer's gonna obviously be putting roofs on this so we can stay nice and dry the windows are getting delivered windows are getting installed we got a lot of things, man. You guys, you and Jared are going to be busy guys here in the upcoming weeks. Yeah, we're looking forward to it. A lot of stuff happening and uh, get this house closed up and into interiors uh, here soon. Yeah, we got a lot of great stuff. We got have heat pump technology powering up the warm board. You guys are going to be the first house in the country. Yeah, we're excited That has about their uh, heat pump uh, complete heat system. So a lot of great things happening. We're going to have Jesus back. We'll get some more insulation in here. Um, yeah, exciting times ahead. So it's about all we have to talk about with concrete. It's in, we're walking on it. It's time to move on, buddy. Awesome, looking forward to it. All right, we're off. <laughs>